Vinu Mankad was one of India's finest cricketers. In 1952, he took 12 wickets in India's first ever victory over England at Madras, and later in the same year, here at Lords, after taking five wickets in England's first innings, scored 184 in India's second innings. Until one Ian Botham broke the record, he took 100 wickets and scored 1,000 runs in test cricket in fewer matches than anyone else. But many today know him for only one thing, and that's regarded as disreputable. Twice during India's tour of Australia in 1947 to 8, he ran out Bill Brown when the latter backed up too soon. The first time was at Sydney when the Indians played an Australian 11. Mankad warned Brown, but when the non striker again left his crease before the delivery, he dismissed him. And in the second test, again in Sydney, he got him out in the same way. Apparently, Brown was well out of his crease when the bales were removed. This kind of dismissal has since been called mancudding. It's been widely regarded as unsportsmanlike. Don Bradman, Australia's captain in that test match, defended the bowler. He wrote, For the life of me, I can't understand why the press questioned this sportsmanship. The laws of cricket make it quite clear that the non-striker must keep within his ground until the ball has been delivered. By backing up too far or too early, the non-striker is obviously gaining an unfair advantage. And the batsman himself said, I deserved it. Much later in 2017, Sunil Gavaskar suggested that his fellow countrymen had been unfairly criminalised. If you want to call it anything, he said, just say the batsman was browned, not man credit. <laughs> but cricketers and public across the board have agreed, on the whole, that mancadding is unsporting. At every level, reactions have been vitriolic and self-righteous. Whatever the laws said, we knew it was wrong, or we thought we knew. Over the past two few years, opinions have shifted. Five years ago, I was here watching England play Sri Lanka in the fourth one-day international of that series. Chasing a total of 300, England were 111 for five when Joss Butler joined Ravi Bapara. They added 133 in 16 overs. During 10 of those overs, they scored 22 twos, many of them from hits against slower bowlers down the ground to long off or long on. As this was going on, it became clear to me that the non-striker, who was likely to be running to the danger end for the second run, was, was starting early from the bowler's crease. I wouldn't want to call it cheating, but it was stealing a march. It looked as though this might make a difference to the result. In the end, Sri Lanka won by only seven runs. Kumar Sangakkara, who would scored a wonderful century earlier in the day, tells me that the Sri Lankan captain complained to the umpires during that match about the lack of any proactive measures by them to stop this. The final match of the series, which was level at 2 all, took place a few days later at Edgbaston. Once again, Butler was batting late in England's innings. Again, the young off-spinner, Suchitra Senanayaka, was bowling. Twice, Sinanayaka warned Butler, and an over later ran him out. England were dismissed for 219, and Sri Lanka won the match by six wickets. The bowler, a young player, who was doing what he was given license to do by his captain and senior players and by the laws, was booed by the crowd. We discussed this issue at the World Cricket Committee a month or so later. The members are always, almost, almost all ex-international players from most of the main cricket-playing countries and from cricketing generations as far back to dinosaurs who played against me, uh, or I played against them, to current players. And to my surprise, there was virtually universal sympathy with the fielding side in this whole scenario. Either the batsman was stealing a march, people felt, or he was being dozy. As a result of the much-increased use of cameras in decision-making, 
If as a bowler you deliver what's afterwards been discovered to have been a no ball by an inch, the batsman, who may have been bowled neck and crop, will be recalled. No one will suggest that you should be given a warning, nor will you win sympathy from teammates or spectators if you're the batsman. Doziness is not generally... I mean, if you're the bowler, sorry. Doziness in sport is not generally rewarded by indulgent kindness. And sport, after all, is as much a matter of keeping your wits about you as of being exceptionally moral. Moreover, now that fitness has become a key feature in the game, especially in limited overs cricket, the inches gained by quick running or lost to quick fielding are often crucial. Several ex-players, especially bowlers, see the hoo-ha about mancudding as a clear illustration of the fact that it's always been a batsman's game. The benefit of the umpire's doubt goes to the batsman, and it's always batsmen who get knighthoods. <laughs> I, too, had changed my mind watching that Sri Lankan match. I was no longer inclined to describe the action of Senanayaka as unethical or as against the spirit of cricket. Five years later, Butler was again run out, not long ago, while backing up, this time in an uh, an IPL match. And bowler was Ravi Ashwin, the Indian off spinner. This dismissal again aroused somewhat shifting responses. There was no warning, and it seemed that before taking the bales off, Ashwin paused briefly with his hand near the stumps, waiting for Butler's bat to be dragged over the line. It's arguable, too, that the decision was actually wrong since Butler's leaving the crease took place after he would reasonably have expected the ball to have been delivered. The on-field umpires might even have been wise to consult the third umpire before coming to a decision. Along with many others, I felt that this was indeed a bit too cunning, a bit shabby. But I'm also certain that it's up to the non-striker to wait until he sees the ball leave the bowler's hand. As for Butler, I'm reminded of Oscar Wilde, who said, to lose one parent <laughs> may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. 